Oh, hey, King. I heard you were looking for an LPVO. Look no further. Oh, Dad's got you. The series finale, it is finally here. Gentlemen, you are watching One Ten Sass Actual, and it is a pleasure to be in your presence. I have assembled the best of the best. The one month ramen noodle diet inducing optics. The sleeping on the couch for a week costing glass. The bank account draining scopes that leave only farts as the single sent to your name. We are talking Schmidt Bender, Night Force, Leupold, Callus, March, and Vortex. These optics are going head to head, comparing the most critical aspects of what makes an LPVO great. You and I, well, we're going on a little adventure. One with an in-depth look and getting your eyes behind each piece of glass. You look at the one power eye box, the max power eye box, the brightness and light transmission of the glass, the clarity, and just how crisp that glass is and whether or not it feels as if it's an extension of your own eye. The feel of each click of the turrets, the reticle, and how useful it is from 100 to 1,000 yards. The illumination brightness, the overall build quality and construction of each optic, and exactly how much damage will be dealt to your wallet by pressing submit on the order screen. So, hold on to your bridges, and grab your tissues because if you are emotionally invested into your favorite brand, some hurt feelers might just be ahead. So what exactly makes a great LPVO? Is it the glass? Is it the reticle? What makes an LPVO most effective? Is it the one in max power eye box? What makes an LPVO the perfect match for your carbine? Is it the cost of your wallet? Exactly what is it that makes an LPVO the best on the market? So gentlemen, let's dive in and start with the absolute most important feat to take into account when choosing an LPVO, the one power eye box. So why is this the most important aspect of an LPVO? Well, an LPVO is supposed to be the pinnacle of a general purpose dual roll carving optic. Not only does it offer precision with variable magnification, but also speed with its one power base setting. On one power, it's not just the need to feel as if it's an extension of your own eye but simply the feel of a dot etched in two and become part of your own eye. It's supposed to have that exact feeling of your typical red dot sight with both eyes open, clean and crisp experience with a generous field of view, while also giving the user a max power magnification, which is usually and generally six, eight, or 10, with a forgiving eye box and ample field of view as well, so you're not engaging nor trying to PID through what feels like a bendy straw. Remember, this is a general purpose optic that will be on a general purpose weapon. It needs to have lightning speed in acquisition of targets and sight picture on base magnification, and also a crisp, bright, and precise extension of your own eye on max power magnification for your precision and PID work. The idea and correct employment of an LPVO is that it lives on one power magnification, for quick and rapid sight picture acquisition for the most seamless transition into immediate and moderate threat and or target engagement needs. And when the situation calls for precision shots or further identification of targets, you simply dial the magnification to what's necessary for your situation. When using magnification, the understanding is that the threat to yourself isn't exactly immediate. Not the, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, shoot now and fight to your sight picture. Right this moment, split second engagement, there's distance and time to decide what needs to happen. A slightly above average shooter should be able to place 
accurate hits on an IP6 size target with a carbine within 300 yards using a base one power magnification. And this is considered three times the typical engagement distance. Therefore, if you really need more magnification, you utilize this distance between you and a target to find concealment or cover, build the most stable and secure shooting position as possible, take that split second to throw the magnification lever and go to work. Ultimately, this is what manufacturers had in mind when developing these optics and is the most universally accepted way to employ the optic. Now some will say, just leave it on some mid-range magnification for your precision work and shoot your near targets off an offset or piggyback mounted red dot. While that definitely can work, you're making it tremendously harder on yourself by doing that. Not only does your field of view grow exponentially smaller the higher you dial your magnification, but the eye relief and light transmission suffers as well, making fighting two-way sight picture that much more difficult. Think of your natural point of aim and posture on the weapon. Grab your carbine and close your eyes and point. Where are you at? Right behind your primary optic. Why should you make it any harder on yourself to roll your carbine over or, you know, pop a chin weld on your stock for a piggyback? Not only are those dots going to be incredibly tight and also arguably much harder to obtain than a base magnification of one, but it's also not your most natural posture and point of aim when you pop the weapon. I'll be the first to admit, I get all scatterbrained when that timer goes beep. I go back to instinct and there is not a more consistent and successful point that provides a quick sight picture better than getting behind your primary optic. especially when it's already a red dot sight feel and has a true one power magnification. Now there's definitely merit to offset dots when using like a higher base magnification, say like three to 18 or five to 25. But why do you think that is? Because nothing beats the speed and quick target and sight picture acquisition than a one power magnification of a primary optic that provides a true red dot sight feel. So let's talk about the optics. First in the lineup is the Vortex 1 to 10 Razor. It has an eye relief of 3.6 inches with a field of view at 100 yards on max power magnification of 11.7 feet and on base magnification that's 116 feet. The Razor is only one of two optics in the entire lineup with a 10 power max magnification. So let's get behind the eye box. First impression that you'll see here is how thin the outside ring is on the actual tube. When you're looking through it, it doesn't obstruct a ton of your field of view outside of the optic. I do enjoy this about the Vortex. It also sports a very generous 116 feet field of view on your base power magnification, which is one of the largest in the entire lineup. However, when you back down to your one power magnification, the thing that I dislike about the Vortex is the amount of fisheye. And when I refer to fisheye, and you're going to hear it quite a few times throughout the video, is the amount of distortion that takes place when viewing through the one power eye box. Walk over to your back door and look out the glass. What you see is a nice, perfect, and flat image. That's how your optic should feel. However, when I refer to fisheye, there's this little bit of distortion. It's almost as if you're looking through the peephole on like somebody's front door. It's not that perfect, flat image as if you were looking out a window in your house. In this image here, you can really start to notice the distortion around the edges of the optic. It starts to bleed in to the center of the reticle. Of course, around the center of the reticle is most crisp, but if you notice and look at the trees, notice how they become a little more blurry. That's because of this fisheye effect. This is intentionally done to gain a wider field of view. However, that wider field of view does come with a list of cons. The top one being the fisheye effect. Now, none of these optics produce a visual effect as extreme as looking through a peephole on a door. However, it is prevalent, some more than others. And on the vortex, where you really start to see this fisheye become prevalent is on that one power, especially when you are swinging the carbine. Things just aren't perfectly flat. When you're looking around and scanning an area, some objects just aren't perfectly flat, especially closer to the outside ring. They just feel distorted, as if they aren't the exact same size as they would be if you weren't looking through the glass. 
And well, this distortion and fisheye effect, I do believe it impacts the overall performance of the Vortex 1 to 10 optic. Now, can you get used to this and become proficient with it? Absolutely. But you're spending all of this money. Why not get that perfect looking out your window, super flat picture? By no means is the Vortex 1 to 10 a terrible optic. It actually does a pretty phenomenal job overall. However, on one power magnification, it just leaves a little bit more to be desired. Moving up to 10 power, the Vortex does get a little dark. Light transmission becomes much more difficult for this optic. The eye box at this magnification becomes a little unforgiving, meaning if you move your head just the slightest wrong direction, unfortunately, you've lost your sight picture. At 10 power, you really need to have a stable and sturdy shooting position, because if not, well, you're gonna be struggling to find that sight picture all throughout the shot. So, let's move on to the next one to 10 optic, the March. The March F Dual Focal Plane Shorty. It has a field of view of 101.5 feet at 100 yards on your base magnification and 10.05 feet at 100 yards on 10 power magnification. Eye relief, it's roughly around 3.8 inches as I had to convert millimeters to bald eagles. Now prior to this video, I'd had exactly zero experience with a March Optic, meaning I had never owned one. I'd simply look through others at matches, but I never owned one and never got any rounds down it. First impressions, well, I was pleasantly surprised. On one power, the amount of fisheye is very, very minimal. You only see it on the outer ring of the optic closest to the edge. And in my opinion, this doesn't quite really affect the one power eye box. Everything in the center is very crisp. When you swing the carbine, everything in your sight picture remains nice and flat. I like this about this optic. Objects in your field of view, as long as they aren't on the very edge, well, they remain undistorted. This is a very important feature for your one power magnification to have objects undistorted in your sight picture. Now to the gripes and complaints. The real complaint that I have with the March 1 to 10 on the one power eye box is well, it's just a little narrow. At 101.5 feet, it leaves just a tiny bit to be desired. It's not exactly large, but it's also not like looking through a bendy straw. But even with the field of view being a little narrow, it makes up for the lack of fisheye. For very crisp, a very clean, very bright, undistorted field of view. When moved up to max power magnification, you see a very crisp, very bright eye box. March did a phenomenal job on the max power magnification. It's very crisp, very clear. Light transmission is fantastic. What's even better is you have another two times magnification over the rest of the lineup. To have this kind of performance with 10 power magnification, well, they did a great job. So let's move on to the next optic, the Night Force. The one to eight power Night Force Attacker. It has a field of view of 96.1 feet at one power magnification at 100 yards, at eight power, 13.1 feet. It's eye relief, 3.7 inches. So let's get behind the glass here and take a look. The very first thing I noticed the second I took a look behind the glass is that 96 feet field of view. It is extremely narrow. Night Force Well has never really been known for their LPVO lineup to have a huge field of view, especially when it comes to the NX-8. The ATACker is an improvement on that. However, in my finding, it is not a substantial gain. Another interesting feat about the ATACker is when looking through the glass at one power, you can see a lot of the interior scope body. Now with every other optic in the lineup, you can see this. However, on the ATACker, it is much more prevalent. And overall, seems to add to the whole feeling of, hey, I'm kind of looking through a toilet paper roll here. Now before I made any purchases and doing all of the research on each optic in the lineup, I noticed 96 feet field of view at 100 yards. I thought to myself, well, that's a little narrow, but I'd be willing to bet that one power eye box is extremely flat. So I had extremely high hopes for this optic on its way in. In fact, with the outstanding reputation Night Force has built over the past couple decades, well, I thought this was going to be amongst the best in the one power. And unfortunately, I hate to say this about the optic, but I was terribly disappointed with this one power eye box. Look at the amount of fisheye that's in the outer circle. It bleeds into the very center of the reticle. When you're sweeping your carbine with this optic on one power, there's just a considerable amount of distortion. 
Now with every LPVO I've ever looked through, there's going to be some fisheye nearest the outer ring, closest to the body of the scope. However, what makes it a good optic is how little of that fisheye and distortion bleeds in to the center of the reticle. Now the lines drawn here show exactly where the distortion stops and becomes a more crisp and flat sight picture. The fisheye and distortion here takes up a significant amount of the field of view. Pair that with an already narrow 96 feet at 100 yard field of view, well, you kind of have an optic that doesn't have a tremendous amount of usable glass. Now, inside the drawn distortion lines, you have a razor sharp image. It's very bright as well. However, that very narrow usable amount of space absolutely does not make up for the rest of that sight picture that looks like you're looking through the apartment door peephole. It's the fisheye magnifying glass look. It absolutely is prevalent on this optic. Now, moving up to the eight power magnification, you really start to see a lot of that interior scope body. But I'd say what I'm most displeased with on max power is how dark the image is. The light transmission of this optic, well, it's just subpar. During this recording, it's a pretty bright day, so you can see why I would be a little disappointed with the performance of this optic and the light transmission on the max power. An important feature of a magnified optic, it needs to be bright. And unfortunately, with the Night Force Attacker, it kind of looks like, well, we've gotten a little bit closer to dusk, and it's midday right now. On a positive note, however, I can confidently say that the Razor does produce a very razor sharp image here on 8 Power. The objects you see in there are very clear and very crisp. It's just a little dark. So let's go ahead and move on to the next optic, the Schmidt Bender. The Dual CC PM2 Schmidt Bender. This is a dual focal plane optic, 1 to 8 Power magnification. The Dual CC has a very comfortable 115.8 feet field of view at 100 yards on base magnification with 16 feet at max power magnification. With an eye relief of 3.5 inches, the Schmidt Bender is one of two in the lineup with a dual focal plane. So let's get behind the glass and take a look. So my very first knee jerk reaction when looking through the Schmidt Bender. Oh wow, is that field of view narrow? When in all actuality, it was the gigantic diopter ring. The Dual CC has a large beveled grooved edge that would make it much easier to adjust in high stress environments. Not gonna lie, it had me in the first half, but then I actually took a good look through it. And that's when I realized I lost a few pounds from jumping to all these conclusions. Anyways, so the one power eye box on the Schmidt Bender, it's absolutely fantastic. You're going to be shooting this optic on base magnification in the Dual CC mode. What that means is the center dot is in the second focal plane, meaning it never changes size. When you magnify the optic, well, that's when everything else starts to grow bigger because it's first focal plane. So not only do you have a razor sharp dot that's very small, very concise, but you also have an accurate ranging reticle throughout all distances, including your subtensions. The lack of fisheye and distortion on the dual CC is very prevalent. When you're sweeping your carbine and transitioning from target to target, the objects you're seeing in your field of view are nice and flat. All of the distortion is excluded to the outside ring. It doesn't really bleed over into the inside of the reticle. It remains at the edges, and I like this a lot. Now, as we crank it up to max power magnification, this is where the Schmidt Bender really shines. Right now in the footage, the sun is hidden behind a lot of clouds, and the eight power still is razor sharp and very bright. It's absolutely fantastic. The best way to describe the eight power magnification on the dual CC is like viewing in HD. Everything is razor sharp. And without a doubt, the most stunning feature of the dual CC is the light transmission and its ability to gather light in dark situations. Remember, this is an overcast right now. The sun is hidden behind clouds and the grass is extremely green. All the colors are extremely vibrant. Even uploading this all the way to YouTube, compressing it down through editing software, the Schmidt Bender image quality remains razor sharp. So let's go ahead and move on to the next optic, the Callus. The 1 to 8 power magnification K18i Callus. The K18i has a tremendous field of view of 127.5 feet at 100 yards and 15.9 feet at max power magnification, an eye relief of 3.74 inches. The 1 power field of view is by far the largest in the lineup, so let's take a look behind the glass. When looking through the glass on one power, there's two knee-jerk reactions that come to mind. First is the size of the reticle. This optic is in the second focal plane, meaning the reticle stays the exact same size throughout all magnification range. But we'll go a little more in depth about the second focal plane when we talk about the reticles. 
the second reaction you get is how incredibly flat your sight picture is. Fisheye effect is non-existent with the K18i. You just don't get the effect of looking through that peephole. When you sweep with the carbine and transition from target to target, each target is exactly how you would see it with both eyes open, not looking through an optic. When you pair that ultra flat image with a tremendous 127 feet field of view, well, you have a very fast and very capable optic. Not to mention, you have a very crisp, very good light transmitting piece of glass. So let's crank it up to eight power magnification. When throwing the magnification, you notice that it stays the same brightness. None of the fisheye bleeds into the reticle. When we finally arrive at the max power, you see that the glass is still nice and crisp in the light transmission. It's fantastic. It stays bright throughout all magnification range while also maintaining a razor sharp image. Now, let's go ahead and move on to our final optic, the Leupold. The Mark 8 CQBSS 1.1 to 8 power magnification Leupold. The only optic in the lineup without a true one power base magnification. It has a linear field of view at 92 feet at 100 yards. On the highest magnification, it's 17.7 feet. Your eye relief, 3.7 inches. So let's go ahead and get your eyes behind the glass. First thing I noticed with the Leupold, it's a very flat sight picture. Light transmission is very solid. And for fisheye, well, it's very minimal. The base magnification glass, well, it's done very well. However, there's one small issue that I just can't get past. It's the 1.1 power base magnification. It just doesn't register right in my brain. When I'm shooting an LPVO on the base magnification, I have both eyes open. I need to see exactly what's in my peripheral and gain as much information and put it in my head as possible. This is one, gonna give me the most situational awareness possible, and two, the fastest and quickest, most seamless transition to the next target. So when I'm looking through the loophole on 1.1 power, you have two different sight pictures going into your brain. Your left eye, staying open, is base magnification. Your right eye, looking through the optic, is slightly magnified. And this gives me two different sight pictures. It just doesn't seem natural. Simply put, there's just too much of a learning curve with the 1.1 base magnification. Now, if you can master the 1.1 base magnification, absolutely more power to you. However, nothing is still going to beat the base one magnification. Now, moving up to the max magnification, which is eight, this is where the Leupold really shines. You have a very bright, very crisp sight picture. Images are razor sharp. Not to mention, you have a huge reticle to work with here. But we'll talk more about reticles here in a moment. If you're the kind of guy who uses an LPVO on max magnification more often than base, this optic might be for you because it is so crisp. Leupold did a fantastic job on max magnification with this optic. All right, guys, so we've discussed all six. Let's go ahead and put them head to head. Coming in at number six, the Leupold Mark 8. Now, unfortunately, because this isn't a base power one magnification, being the 1.1, it's just too difficult to use. Unfortunately, that's what makes it suffer, and it gets its place at number six. Coming in at number five, the Night Force Attacker, with its very narrow field of view of 96 feet and a significant amount of fisheye, it earns its spot at number five. Moving to fourth place, we have the Vortex 1 to 10 Razor. It's forgiving 116 feet field of view at one power magnification is what saves this optic. It has a decent amount of fisheye, however, it is manageable. Fourth place, the Vortex Razor. Moving to the number three slot, we have the March 1 to 10 Shorty. A very crisp, very clean one power eye box. It's a little narrow, but the lack of fisheye brings this one into the top three. At number two, we have the Schmidt Bender Dual CC, a very forgiving 115.8 feet field of view, very minimal fisheye, bright and crisp at both max and base magnification. The Schmidt Bender, number two. And finally, at the number one spot with an unparalleled one power eye box, crisp, zero fisheye, the Callus K18i. The K18i earns its number one spot because of how flat the image is. Your sight picture is just like looking out your front door. Outstanding performance. So another key aspect is illumination and brightness of the dot. Not only is an illuminated reticle and dot imperative in low light situations, but also in the brightest of days as well. 
It's absolutely a fact that you are going to pick up and place a bright illuminated dot better than a slightly opaque black dot that doesn't contrast well from the natural environment. Science, right? In ultra bright daylight to the lowest of light environments, being able to quickly and easily pick up your reticle is incredibly important. And illumination makes that doing so, so much easier. So let's talk about our first optic, the Vortex. The 1 to 10 Razor features 11 different brightness settings. On all the optics you're going to see, it will be set to max. The Vortex has a very bright illuminated reticle, especially when you back it down to one power, you just have a giant red blob. Move it up to eight power magnification, well, you have a giant red blob as well, but it's a little bit more crisp. The dot is very easy to pick up. Now, let's move on to the next optic. The March 1 to 10 Shorty. So here's the thing with the March. The dot itself is extremely bright. It's very, very bright. The only issue is, is that the reticle is in the first focal plane while the dot is in the second focal plane. So the dot itself is extraordinarily small. This is a good thing and it can be a bad thing depending on your use. For precision work, that dot being very small is fantastic because you can put that reticle exactly where you need it to be without any guessing where your point of aim is versus a large dot that covers more of the target. On the other side, the con is that the dot being so small, it's much harder to pick up. However, because it's so bright, it completely negates that. Overall, dot brightness for the March is done very well. Now on to the next optic, the Night Force Attacker. The Attacker features an extremely bright dot on one power and max power magnification. You cannot miss this thing. It is bright, it is in your face. If you can't see this thing, you probably should get your eyes checked. If there's one thing the Night Force Attacker does extremely well, it's dot brightness. No if and buts about it. Moving forward, we have another dot in the second focal plane, the Schmidt Bender Dual CC. On one power magnification, you absolutely cannot miss this dot. It's bright and it is vibrant red. Making quick dot acquisition, very simple. Now, let's move it up to eight power. Something super neat about the Schmidt Bender is that you have two choices, an illumination. You can illuminate just the dot or you can illuminate the dot and the reticle. As you can see here, your windage and elevation holds are gonna be illuminated along with the center dot. This makes finding your dot and reticle tenfold easier. The next optic is the second focal plane, K18i Callus. The Callus has an interesting color for the dot. They're almost like an orange color versus a very bright, vibrant red. Now, while this is definitely exasperated here in the video, it's very apparent that the dots aren't the vibrant red. They're much more closer to an orange. The orange definitely provides an interesting contrast looking at most of your targets. They're still very easy to pick up on eight power and one power. When we back out the base magnification, you can start to see a truer color of the actual dots. I will say the video, again, has made it look much more orange than it looks in person. They are slightly more red than this, but I gotta say, they definitely aren't that bright and rich red that you see with all of the other optics in the video. Now moving over to the last scope, we have the Leupold Mark 8. It has a very interesting dot on it, not because it's the center that's illuminated, but it's the whole ring around it. It's a donut that's illuminated. Simply put, I think this comes down to preference, whether you like this or hate this. For CQB work and ultra fast dot acquisition, well, it's tough to be beat. It is a huge red dot. You absolutely cannot miss it. Now this is where things get really interesting. As you can see here, the dot is semi-red, then it turns black. This is not the actual optic malfunctioning. I've seen so many people crying about, oh, my Mark 8, it flickers. The reticle just flickers red, then it goes black, red, and black. That thing's a hunk of junk. No, you're actually wrong. Leupold did this on purpose. And let me tell you how it works. On one power, you almost always see the dot. It's hard not to find it. When you get up to eight power, this is where you start to hear the complaints. When you see absolutely zero illumination, this means that you are not centered on the optic. Leupold intentionally designed it to work this way. It's saying, hey, get behind the optic and get yourself lined up. And when you actually figure out this information, it begins to make sense and you kind of start to appreciate it. It's a very interesting thing that Leupold did with this optic. And to be quite frank, I kind of like it. So let's go ahead and get to the rankings. First thing I'd like to say is that each and every one of these dots are going to be daylight bright. You absolutely cannot miss them. They all do a fantastic job. None of them are subpar by any means. And on eight power magnification, you absolutely cannot miss any of the illuminated dots. 
So how we're gonna rank these dots is gonna be on base power magnification. You need to be able to get that red dot in your sight picture ASAP. And since you're not gonna struggle at all with any of these optics on the eight power magnification, it would be best to compare them on one power. So coming in at number six, we have the K18i Callus. So here's the thing, you will have no problem finding this dot in any lighting conditions. I just gotta say that it's orange. It's closer to orange, it's not the bright, vibrant red. And unfortunately, that little bit of orange hue that it has to it, well, it doesn't contrast perfectly like a red dot would. However, I can confidently say that I have zero issues using this dot to find it, placing it on a target, not a big deal whatsoever. But we're talking about pure brightness here. And well, the callus just isn't number one. And even with that dot being extremely crisp with no spillover and illumination, it's coming in at number six. Now coming in at number five is by far the most interesting reticle in the lineup, the Leupold Mark VIII. Simply put, you're either gonna love or hate this dot. It's a giant donut, so the actual center of the reticle is not illuminated. It's just around the crosshairs, making for just one giant red dot, which using it on one power is actually a pretty good thing. The problem comes in when you just dial it up to eight. But since we're doing one power magnification for this, we have to talk about the actual dot brightness. Well, the brightness of the dot isn't what I'd call exceptional. It's kind of more a dull red. While it is easy to find, it's a duller red, and unfortunately, this brings it in at number five. Moving in at the number four spot, the March 1 to 10 Shorty. So the March has a very vibrant red and a very bright red dot. The only thing I can say about it is that it's just a touch too small. And this is just because the dot is in the second focal plane. So when you crank up the magnification, you have an ultra precision dot. But what makes the March dot so great, even being so small, the illumination is so bright that it actually appears larger than what it seems. Finding and placing this dot on your target at base power magnification, you'll have no issues. Solidifying its spot at number four. Breaking into the number three slot, we have the Vortex Razor. The dot is insanely bright. Vortex did a phenomenal job making this dot daylight bright, so no matter what, you are going to find that dot in your sight picture. The only real gripe I have with it is that it's not very crisp. The illumination bleeds out and it doesn't make a perfect uniform dot. This is okay at CQB distance. However, if you're trying to aim for precision, this is where it becomes a little bit of an issue, solidifying its spot at number three. At the number two position, we have the Dual CC Schmidt Bender. What I really like about the dot is one, it's fine, and two, it is a rich, deep, and vibrant red. You cannot miss this dot. The two best things about this dot is the color. It contrasts very well with all of your targets. And the size, the size of the dot is perfect. It's not too large where it covers up too much of the target, and it's not too small that you can barely find it. It's the right size and right color giving the dual CC the number two spot. So let's move on to the night force that takes number one for dot brightness. So let's talk about why the attacker one to eight takes the number one spot here. Simply put, you have the best of it all. You have the color that contrasts very well with all of your targets. You have the brightness that is extremely bright in the brightest of days, and you have the size. Not only do you have this horseshoe that goes around the very center dot, for CQB, that's perfect because you have this giant blob and you cannot miss it. But the best part of it all, you have two illuminated points. The very center dot is extraordinarily fine, and I like this for your precision work, and it's still the same brightness as the outside. The outside horseshoe, this is fantastic because again, it gives you that lightning fast acquisition of your dot, solidifying the Night Force attacker at the number one spot. Moving on, the reticle. Without it, you're simply just guessing. With a quality reticle, you're given the information to be the best precision shot dealer on the block. In the lineup, we have a tactical Christmas tree with over 20 mil of hold to a minimalist style Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Not very full, but gives you exactly what you need without giving you a stroke quadruple checking your correct holds because it feels like half the Bible has been written inside the reticle. So let's start with the vortex. So to make this as simple as possible, we're gonna compare all of the optics in their offering of the Millerad reticle. We're then gonna run each brand's reticle across the screen, let you get a good look at it, then compare. 
The Vortex offers your point of aim center dot surrounded by an illuminated circle. You have 10 mil of windage hold with 11 mil of elevation hold. Now on to the March. The March gives you a ton of information. You have 17 mil of elevation hold. It gives you eight of windage hold. And also at the top, you have holds for shooting high angles or you haven't returned your scope back to zero. There's five mils of hold for this. Your point of aim center dot is a very fine, small illuminated dot. So let's move on to the Night Force Attacker. You have overall 20 mil of elevation hold. I would consider 10 to be the most useful of it, but it is marked for 20. For your windage, you have 15 mil overall. I would consider 10 of that to be the most useful, split by halves. Moving forward, we have the Schmidt Bender Dual CC. You have six mil of elevation hold and also six written for windage. These are what I consider the most useful. You do have 20 mil of overall windage and elevation holds. However, they're a little bit more difficult to use. Next, we have the Callus K18i reticle. Definitely the most simplistic reticle out of any of the offerings. You simply have four mil of windage and four mil of elevation. It's kind of one of those things, well, what you see is what you get. Very straightforward, very minimalist. That leaves us with the final, the Mark 8 CQBSS. This is the H27 reticle. You have over 20 mil of usable holds and elevation and five mil for windage. This reticle here is the definition and pinnacle of tactical Christmas tree. You have a tremendous amount of information giving you absolutely zero shortage of hold. So now that you've seen them all, let's go ahead and rank these optics. But before we get into that, I'd like to say that reticle choice can be very subjective. Each one of these reticles in the lineup do their own thing very well. However, we are talking about a general purpose weapon. An LPVO is typically one to eight power magnification. So we are not going to be shooting thousands of yards here on the daily with this optic. An LPVO best fits a general purpose carving. And with a general purpose carving, you're gonna be shooting zero yards all the way to 1,000, but typically much less than that. This isn't going to be on a target match precision weapon. As stated earlier, it needs to have lightning fast sight picture acquisition at CQB distances, and you also need to be able to PID, throw up your magnification, and make precision shots at longer range. It needs to do it all, not just one thing. So let's talk about which reticles do it best. Starting at number six, we have the Leupold Mark VIII. There is so much information here. It's a tactical Christmas tree. While this would be a dynamite reticle for a five to 25 long range precision bolt gun, for a general purpose carbine, I genuinely do not need 21 mil of hold. And to be quite frank, the information and how it's laid out in the reticle, it's quite busy. I wouldn't consider it a very clean layout. There's so much information and each hash mark takes up so much space. When choosing an LPVO reticle, you have to consider how you're going to employ the weapon and employ the optic. And an LPVO being a general purpose, do it all kind of glass, well, the Leupold Mark VIII simply does not allow you to make quick and fast calls on your holds. I find myself constantly second guessing double and triple checking to see if my holds are accurate and making sure the bullet is going to go where I need it to. And the way that the information is laid out on the H27, well, in my opinion, it's just not built for speed, making it number six in the lineup. Now at the number five slot, we've got the Vortex Razor 1 to 10. So the Razor isn't necessarily a bad reticle. I just think that the information in the way that it is displayed doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. Let's look at elevation hold four mils. If you see, you have four mils of elevation. However, when you go over to windage, you only have three, even though there's only three mil of windage holds. When you compare it to the night force, I would say these reticles are almost identical. However, the information is organized much better. Looking at the night force with four elevation hold, it's also four windage hold. I really like this because it's very simple to do it in my head. Quick acquisition, four, four, boom. Versus looking at the vortex, you see four, three. So, okay, I go down to four mil hold at the number four. I have to think, okay, that's actually three. Simply put, the night force and vortex are very, very similar reticles. It's just night force does it better. Now, am I being a little too nitpicky here? Yeah, probably so, but we are comparing them. So this is what we have to do. 
Any shooter could be absolutely proficient with either reticle there. And in the right hands, it probably wouldn't make a single bit of difference because they've mastered their own reticle, which is definitely the most important aspect. Get out there and shoot your stuff. But getting back on topic, the Vortex simply does not have as much information as the Night Force does. While they're laid out very clean, the Vortex is gonna take its place at number five. At the four spot, we have the March F Shorty. The March features a very solid reticle. It's not crazy busy and the information is laid out very crisp. The one thing I really love about this reticle is the center dot. Again, this is a dual focal plane optic. So the reticle changes with your magnification. However, the center dot, your point of aim remains the same. It is a very, very fine dot. I love this about it because you can aim so precise with it. You never have to worry about a dot that's covering up too much of your target. However, there's a couple shortcomings I'd like to point out. First is the dots for the elevation windage holds. Now, as I said before, the hold dots are very fine, meaning they are very small. The problem with this is, is they are slightly opaque. The transparency of these dots sometimes make them a little bit harder to find in all daylight conditions. If you're first looking behind this optic, it can be a little tricky. However, with enough practice, it shouldn't be an issue for you whatsoever. The second and final complaint about the reticle are the hash marks for your elevation holds. In my experience, I have found they are just too large. They kind of start to cover up some of your windage calls. In my opinion, I think a number finely etched into the reticle would be a better choice. While this definitely would make the optic more expensive and harder to manufacture, it wouldn't be impossible, and I think it would be a nice touch. Overall, the March reticle is fantastic to use. It's very user-friendly and has just the right amount of information, solidifying its spot at number four. Coming in at number three, we have the Night Force Attacker. The attacker has a very clean laid out reticle. It gives you ample information without overloading you. I find it's very easy to track your holds and call your windage. One thing I especially like about the Night Force reticle is that both somebody who's experienced and an amateur could easily use and manipulate all of your holds and all of your dots on this reticle. The only real thing I would change about the Night Force is the horseshoe that sits around your center dot. Now, I understand that it's important for it to be there because at CQB and base power magnification, well, it's very bright and it's very large. Easy acquisition. However, if you're using it on any magnification, it's just large and in the way, solidifying its spot at number three. Breaking into the top two. In the two slot, we have the Callus K18i 3GR reticle. While this might be one of the more controversial picks in the entire lineup, hear me out. There's just something that needs to be said about an ultra minimalist reticle. Realistically, you have to ask yourself, exactly how much windage and elevation holds do I really need? What do I need on a general purpose carbine? What are my typical engagement ranges? I would venture to say it would be a very fair guess to say 99% of you are going to be using an LPVO on some sort of 5.56 carbine or a shortened large frame gasser. Now ask yourself, what's going to be the most realistic range that you're going to be engaging with your 5.56 carbine and how far exactly is it going to be effective? With most of us running an 11 and a half inch 14.5 or 16 inch 5.56 carbine, I would say that most effective range is gonna be somewhere within 500 yards. Now, can you stretch it out further than that? Absolutely you can. I've seen dudes hit a thousand yards with a 14.5 inch 5.56 using 77 grain bullets. So yes, it can be done. You can stretch it out much further than that. But if shooting past 500 to 600 yards is your typical engagement, well, you probably don't need an LPVO. Something like a three to 18, five to 25 would be more ideal for you. So in comes the Callus 3GR reticle. So Avrovsky says, hey, what kind of guns are these optics going to be used on? Probably a 5.56 carbine between 14.5 and 16 inches. What's the typical engagement and effective range of a 5.56 bullet fired out of said gun? Well, probably 500 yards. So let's talk ballistics and the design behind the 3GR. For instance, my 11.5 inch SR-15, it runs roughly 2750 feet per second with my M193 bulk ammo. That puts me four mil of adjustment at 475 yards, right within that 500 yard range. A 14.5 inch running some hot M193 is gonna put you right around 2950 muzzle velocity. That's gonna get you right to 500 yards with four mil of adjustment. Now put that K18i on a 14 and a half inch 6.5 Creedmoor, a short large frame gasser. That's gonna get you out to 575 with roughly just four mil of adjustment. While I really do love my tactical Christmas tree reticles, there is something to say about a minimalist style reticle 
vehicle like the 3GR. It's simple, but it works. It's not overloading your brain with so much information, making you second guess where you're at in your holds. Take for instance, the Mark 8 reticle. There's over 20 mil of holdage for elevation. That's gonna put you somewhere around like 1100 yards with a 14 and a half inch carbine. Nobody is shooting that, and besides that, that bullet has gone subsonic well before that, and the odds of you hitting your target at that point are slim to none. It wouldn't be wrong to say that most shooters will never shoot much over 600 yards in their lifetime. And well, the K18i 3GR reticle excels at that, solidifying its place at number two. So let's move on to number one, the Schmidt Bender Dual CC. Its reticle, simply put, is just the best blend of minimalist and tactical Christmas tree. You don't have a ton of information overloading your brain, but it's also not leaving you guessing when you get to a little bit more of an extended range. The information laid out is very user friendly. Each of your elevation and windage holds below zero have the number written just to the right. It takes out a lot of that double checking in your hold calls. But one of the really nice things about this optic is the illuminated reticle. None of the other optics have a reticle that is fully illuminated like the Schmidt Bender. This makes your low light slash no light shots that much easier, making it the number one reticle choice. Moving forward and directly related to your reticle, the brains behind the madness, the turrets. Controlling where you want your pill to end up after you've pulled the trigger is crucial. And even more crucial than that is having concise and accurate adjustments telling your reticle where to go to deliver that pill home while giving you the same exact accuracy when returning to your zero. So let's talk about the reliability of these turrets. Through my testing, I ripped, turned around, screwed, unscrewed, all the way from the absolute lowest point of elevation to the max point of elevation. Same with the windage. All of these optics tracked perfectly well. This is just what you should expect from a high-end optic. True tracking and consistent tracking. So how I'll rate these turrets will be on a few different things. How they lock and if they lock, whether the turrets are exposed or not exposed, if they have any audible click when you move each turret, and finally how they feel in your thumb with each click movement. So let's start off with the March. The March has very low profile exposed turrets, which I do like. Low profile means less things to get caught on, and exposed turrets means I know exactly where my mill is at at all times. Each click is very concise. It's engineered and manufactured extremely well with high precision. It feels fantastic. You feel the vibration of each click in your thumb and you can also hear the click. Both things I really like. So let's move over to the Leupold. The Mark 8 CQBSS has a very interesting turret system. It is locking and they are exposed turrets and they are also a little high profile. What's strange is they have this locking pinch turret. So that means you have to pinch each side exactly in the middle so that way it unlocks the turret and then you can finally dial whatever mill you need to be. However, it's not exactly user friendly. A little difficult to use you might say. Your fingers have to be exactly in the middle to depress each one of those locking caps. If you don't pinch your thumbs in the perfect spot, you are not unlocking this turret to change your dope. And I gotta be honest, it can be a little frustrating to do. If you're centered behind the glass, cheek weld in the perfect spot, and you need to dial up 1.2 mil. Okay, great. So you reach up to your turret, try and turn it. Well, your hands aren't in the perfect spot. Now you've gotta fiddle around with it, find where the locking turrets are at, and then depress them. It can be a little frustrating. Now, if you are used to it, Great, fantastic, you will do well with it. However, if you are new to this or you're kind of in a high stress environment and need to do it in a match, well, it can be just a little frustrating. The clicks themselves are semi-audible. Each click though is a little mushy. It doesn't feel exactly precise, something I really don't enjoy about this. So let's talk about the next one. The Schmidt Bender Dual CC. It has exposed turrets, low profile turrets, and also locking turrets. So three great features right off the bat. So how do they work? The turret is a two piece system. So you have this locking sleeve where it shows you all of your mill. To lock the turret, you simply press down. It will also show you that the turret is locked in the red lettering. If you need to change your point of impact, simply press up, then you have unlocked the turret, dial to where you need, and then slide the turret back down. It's a very easy to use system, very straightforward. One thing I would like to say though, are locking turrets that important on an LPVO? Well, I don't know, I suppose it's user preference. In my opinion, I don't necessarily think it's a mandatory option to have. 
In my opinion, I think I'd rather just have a very nicely machined turret that has very concise, accurate, audible, a strong mechanical click that you can feel through your thumbs with each adjustment click and a buttery smooth yet very intentional throw with each of your adjustments. But hey, maybe I'm crazy. Locking turrets could be the way to go. I definitely see the merit in them. Unintentionally changing your point of impact because your turret got caught on some kit or something, I don't know. I suppose that could definitely make for a bad day. However, I would like precisely machined, more intentional throws rather than having to deal with some sort of locking mechanism. So let's move on to the next optic, the Callus K18i. Simply put, the K18i's turrets are just garbage. They are machined well, they make nice audible click, you can feel it through each thumb when you make an adjustment, however, not only are the turrets capped, but they don't have any writing on them. How do you know what mill of adjustment you are sitting at? You never know where your zero's at. You cannot dial with this optic. It's absolutely ridiculous, in my opinion, in 2023, that you manufacture a high-end tactical LPVO without your mill adjustments written on the reticle. However, there is a cure for that. From across the pond, you can actually order an exposed turret. It's a fantastic upgrade. In fact, call it mandatory because you are going to need this if you ever want to dial dope and then get back to zero, which spoiler alert, you are going to if you ever shoot a match. So I found this on the internet from a dealer. I think it was from Austria. I can't remember exactly. It took like two weeks to get. Insulation took literally like, I don't know, 30 seconds. Fantastic upgrade, mandatory. So uh, yeah, mark that down. Let's move on to the next optic, the Night Force Attacker. The Night Force has capped turrets, which I'm not a huge fan of, but that's okay because they do actually have what mill adjustments you have made written on the turret. Only problem is you need to put these caps back on after you've changed your dope. Why? Because they aren't 100% weatherproof. They do everything they possibly can with keeping dirt, dust, and water out. However, they're not 100%. And that makes it just a little frustrating because I don't like to run caps on my turrets. I like to be able to look and see exactly where my zero's at, what I've dialed, and how I need to get back. I don't want to have to worry about taking off my caps, putting them back on after I make an adjustment, or taking them off to go shoot a stage if I know I need to make a couple adjustments, put them in my pocket. I don't know. I'll probably lose them at some point. And knowing 2023, they probably cost a bajillion dollars to replace. So anyways, the turret adjustments themselves, well, they're kind of mushy feeling. You don't exactly know how many clicks you've made through your thumb. You kind of have to sit and watch and dial exactly to where you're at. It's a little tough to use, but they are serviceable, absolutely. So let's go ahead and move on to the next optic, the Vortex Razor. Just like the Night Force, the Razor also has capped turrets. And it's only when the caps are off can you make an adjustment to the optic. So again, yeah, kind of frustrating. Not only do you have to keep track of your turret caps, that if you lose, they probably cost, again, a bajillion dollars, but they aren't 100% weatherproofed underneath. Now, does this mean that your Night Force or Vortex is going to be ruined if you get caught in a little bit of rain without your turret caps on? No, but... Long and extended exposure to the elements, well, you might just have yourself a bad day. As far as the feeling of the turrets go, they're not exactly mushy. They are a little concise, but they definitely could use some work. They don't really have any loud audible clicks with them either, so you really have to watch yourself when you're dialing your dope. So now that we've discussed them all, let's get to the ratings. Coming in at rock bottom, rightfully earning its place there and solidifying at number six is the Callus K18i the unnumbered capped turret disaster. But here's the thing, if you were to do that mandatory upgrade of the exposed turret, you could easily see this one in the top two because each click is very concise, well-machined, high precision, and each click is very audible. But we are not judging these optics based on what upgrades they can get. How they come from the factory is how we are judging them. Callus, you're at number six. And go home and think about what you've done. And not too far ahead of the Callus is the Leupold Mark 8. Those pinch turrets are just a pain in the butt to use. I do not like them. You have to have your hands perfectly on those pinch rings to order to unlock it. And the clicks, well, they're not very audible and they're kind of mushy. To be quite frank with you, nothing about these turrets excite me. Number five. Moving on to the four spot, we have the Night Force Attacker. 
cap turrets, mushy, non-audible clicks. It just gets the job done and that's it. Does nothing well. Now breaking into the top three, we have the Vortex Razor. Cap turrets again, woohoo, nothing exciting. The turrets, well, they could use a little bit of work. They're not exactly mushy, a little bit more stiff than the Night Force, with a little bit more audible click noise, but I certainly wouldn't deem it a significant upgrade over the Night Force as far as the turrets go. Number three, Vortex. Coming in hot at number two, we have the March F Shorty 1 to 10. Ultra low profile exposed turrets. Heck yes, we love it. The clicks, they're nice and audible. They're very concise. You can feel each click movement through your thumb. And that's something that you just can't underappreciate. Well done, March, number two slot. So we have the winner of the turrets, the Schmidt Bender Dual CC. Not only does it have the locked turrets, but it has ultra low profile uncapped turrets. Each click is nice and audible to your ear. You can feel each click through your thumb. It is no problem whatsoever keeping your cheek weld, looking through the glass, and making your clicks without ever having to look at your turret. So that's a wrap on the turrets. Let's move to the final talking point and get to who makes the best LPVO on the market. So in this final segment, we are going to discuss the price. This is the street value for each of these optics. If you were to hop on the internet and look for one of these to buy, this is what you're gonna have to pay. Starting with the Schmidt Bender, it comes in at number six, $5,780. Oh my goodness. Whew, talk about some damage to the bank account. At number five, we have the Leupold. It is $3,799. That's also some damage to the billfold. At number four, we have the Night Force, $2,900. Starting to come back to reality here. At number three, we have the March. It's 2,641 beans. Whew. At number two, the Callus K18i, 2,599 smackaroos. And at number one, the cheapest optic that we had in the entire review, $2,500. So we have the prices on all of these. Let's talk about what's been over a month in the making, LPVO Battle Royale. Who makes the best LPVO on the market? Starting at number six. But before I announce any of the winners, first, I would like to say thank you to the subscribers for helping me grow this page. Man, we have had so much fun doing this and really hope to keep bringing you rad content. But anyways, back to the rankings. Before I announce number six, I do wanna say that each one of these pieces of glass are phenomenal optics. If you had to grab one of these optics out of a bucket with a blindfold on your head, well, you could not go wrong. Each of these are going to serve you well, but some just do it better than others. So number six, we have the Leupold Mark 8. The Mark 8 definitely does not suffer from lack of glass quality. In fact, it's amongst the best, bright and crisp with vibrant colors. But here's its major downfall. We have a base power magnification of 1.1. Using this optic on base power magnification, simply put, will not be as fast as a base power of a true 1.1. It's going to make more sense to your brain. You're gonna find your sight picture that much quicker. It has its own proprietary illumination system. If you're not perfectly square on the optic, it's not gonna be fully bright, and it's gonna have this flicker effect. You have the pinch turrets, which are a pain to use. And with all that said, at a price of $3,800, well, you just don't get a ton of bang for your buck. I don't see this as a $3,800 optic. Me personally, I see it around $2,200 to $2,400. Number six, the Leupold Mark VIII. Coming in at number five, we have the Vortex 1 to 10 Razor. Although it has 10 power magnification available to the user, I genuinely think this optic should have been an eight power. It gets very dark when you get to max power. There's a lot of fisheye at the one power magnification as well. While it does have a nice illuminated dot, you have the capped turrets, which you're pretty much guaranteed to lose at some point in your life. Your turrets have a little bit of a mushy adjustment, not super audible. Light transmission isn't quite the best. On one power, you do have a decent amount of daylight brightness. However, when you crank it up to eight to 10 power, say, well, it's gonna be dark. 
Now, even though this is the cheapest optic in the lineup at $2,500, I feel the real value for this optic is somewhere between $1,900 and $2,100. I think if it was readily available to the consumers at that price point, I think you would have a very good optic for the money. Number five, the Vortex Razor. Coming in at number four, we have the Night Force one to eight power attacker. Having exactly zero experience with this optic prior to this video, I had extremely high hopes. Night Force has an incredible name. People talk about this optic. You see people running this optic often. So I was extremely excited to get this optic in. But the first thing I thought to myself when I looked through it, I literally said out loud, oh, wow, this is it? Hands down, one of the most disappointing optics I've ever received. It's heavy, one of the heaviest in the lineup. It has a very narrow field of view, 96 feet at 100 yards. It's literally like looking through a toilet paper roll. And there's a significant amount of fisheye in this thing. When you're sweeping your carbine, going from target to target, none of the images are flat unless they're right inside the reticle. Everything around the edges of that, well, it kind of looks distorted, like you're looking through that hotel peephole. You have the cap turrets. You have those mushy clicks. They're not audible. They don't feel great in your hand. When you're adjusting them, you're gonna have to double check your work. On one power, you do have a pretty bright, pretty vibrant sight picture. However, on eight power, the max magnification, well, it gets kind of dark. As overall performance goes, literally in every single category, it's just straight middle of the road. It's not fantastic, but it's not terrible. It pains me to say this because I like Night Force optics, but the A-Tacker is the most underwhelming piece of kit I have ever seen. Leaving the A-Tacker in the number four slot. Breaking into the top three, we have the March F 1 to 10 Shorty. You have an outstanding one power eye box. You have an outstanding 10 power eye box. That extra two power of zoom, well, it does help. It's ultra short, doesn't have a huge footprint on the top of your carbine. It's extremely light. It has excellent exposed turrets with very audible, very nice clicks with each adjustment. You have a dual focal plane reticle, meaning the dot is in the second focal plane with the rest in the first. That makes the dot extremely precise. No more guessing where your dot is at. You don't have this humongous first focal plane centered dot covering up your entire target. Instead, you have a very nice pinhead poke dot. And to top it off, you have a parallax adjustment. So no matter what the distance is to your target, you always have a razor crisp reticle and image. It's interesting because none of the other optics in the lineup have one and come to find out, it's actually pretty useful. Great touch. At $2,600, to be quite frank, you have a tremendous bang for your buck here. Again, having zero experience with anything March, and especially the 1 to 10, this was a pleasant surprise. I had no idea what to expect on this. And to be honest, I couldn't hardly find any legitimate reviews about it. I'm glad I stumbled upon this optic. The March Shorty 1 to 10 coming in at number 3. Earning its spot there? Absolutely. So gentlemen, we find ourselves with the final two optics. Schmidt Bender Dual CC. Callus K18i. Which is going to come out on top? Which optic has the best overall performance? Which optic is the best LPVO on the market today? So let's talk about these two. The Callus K18i. It has an unparalleled field of view at 127 feet at base power magnification. Crystal clear glass, very bright, excellent light transmission. Undoubtedly, the flattest one power eye box I have seen out of any LPVO on the market, period. Its base power is the truest extension of your own eye. No fish eye effect, just both your eyes open and your dot pointed directly at your target. But is this performance enough to make it the number one optic on the market? On the other hand, you have the German Space Magic, the dual focal plane dual CC with its razor sharp glass. It's like viewing life in HD. An impressive one power field of view of 116 feet, flat and bright. Dual illumination of just the dot or the dot and your reticle, your choice. Exposed and locking turrets with your mill adjustments written plain and clearly on the sides. But is this enough to make it the best LPVO on the market today? 
So guys, I'm gonna shoot you straight here. This is an incredibly difficult decision to make. I mean, the thing is, both of these optics are absolutely phenomenal pieces of kit. And without doubt, these are the very two best LPVOs on the market. There's no ifs and buts about it. At max power magnification, both are absolutely razor sharp, excellent light transmission, very vivid colors. At base power, essentially zero fisheye effect. Both optics are made incredibly well. You can tell there's quality craftsmanship, precision machining, putting these things together. So here's the deal. I promised you the best LPVO on the market. Gentlemen, let's talk about it. The Schmidt Bender PM2 Dual CC 1 to 8 power. Hands down, the best LPVO on the market today. You have the glass, the one power eye box, the durability and build quality, the excellent design of the turrets. Everything about this optic is so refined. The biggest thing I look for with any glass, LPVO, high powers, red dot, doesn't matter. I need this optic to be an extension of my own eyeball. I don't want to have to fight with fisheye. I don't want to have to fight with parallax. I don't want to have to fight for that perfect sight picture. I want to point and shoot. All I need to see is my reticle. And that's what you get with the Schmidt Bender Dual CC. The biggest thing that absolutely blew me away with the Dual CC is on eight power magnification when you are looking at your targets at an extended range. It's like viewing in HD. You have razor sharp images and the colors, they're so vibrant. And what's truly impressive is how well it gathers light. Even at dusk or dawn, it doesn't appear as if you are looking into some dark hollow tube. It feels as if you've rewound or fast forward the clock to get more daylight. The controls are laid out so well and extremely user friendly. The turrets, when you make an adjustment, you can hear the click. You can feel the mechanics of the optic working through your thumb when making adjustments, giving you that positive reinforcement that, hey, I have made 0.5 mil adjustment. No guesswork involved. I don't have to leave my cheek weld in order to, you know, dial up, say, 2.5 mil, 3 mil. I know exactly what I have done through the feeling of my thumb and hearing the mechanics working. And then you have the fantastic one power eye box, crisp razor sharp images, little to no fish eye. You have an incredible amount of illumination with the center dot, along with a very generous 116 feet field of view. And then you have the dual focal plane reticle. That center dot remains the exact same size throughout all magnification. And what's especially nice about that is, well, when you are dialed up to max power magnification, you're looking at a target, say, 600 meters away with all of the first focal plane reticles here in the lineup. That dot in the center, it gets huge. And unfortunately, the further you are away from your target, the more that dot covers your target. And because you have this giant illuminated blob covering your target, it makes it much more difficult to find the exact center of your point of aim. But with the Dual CC's second focal plane dot, you're not going to have to back out of your magnification in order to cover less of your target with that reticle. Overall, its performance absolutely makes the Dual CC the best LPVO on the market. So let's talk about number two. The Callus K18i. An absolutely phenomenal piece of glass. Unparalleled one power eye box, feeling, fisheye that's non-existent in 127 feet field of view. The minimalist reticle with good clean cut information, but not information overload. You're not seeing tons and tons of dots, hash marks, blasting your brain and your eyeballs with information that might not even be necessary to the shot you're about to make. The light transmission of this optic, whether you're on base or max power magnification, is outstanding. Colors are super vivid and images razor sharp. Overall, I really only have two legitimate complaints about the Callus K18i. First being the turrets. From the factory, there's absolutely zero useful information on them. However, as you can see here, an extraordinarily easy installation of actual exposed turrets that have your mill adjustments plainly stated. So I guess my real complaint is here, you shouldn't have to buy calluses or Suaro's OEM exposed turrets. They should just be included from the factory. 
I don't know. I mean, it's not a terribly expensive upgrade, but it's the fact that you have to. When again, it should just be standard from the factory or even include them in the scope purchase. So that way you have a choice in the matter, whether or not you want exposed turrets or covered turrets with no writing on them. My second and final complaint with this optic, and I suppose is much more legitimate than the first, is that we need more reticle choices. While I really and thoroughly love the minimalist style reticle that's in the 3GR of the K18, I am certain that there are users out there that would enjoy the tactical Christmas tree. And in my opinion, this glass is some of the most underrated piece of kit on the market. And I believe it could be holding Callus back for not having more reticles for shooters to choose from. Overall, the K18i is a phenomenal optic. And really, here's the thing. These optics are extremely different in price. Schmidt Bender, you're talking $5,600. With the Callus, you're talking $2,500. That's a tremendous difference in price. So you have to ask yourself, is the Schmidt Bender worth over twice the amount of a K18i? So let's break this down. On the market today, the Schmidt Bender, undeniably the best LPVO on the market. There is no questioning that. However, you can question, is its performance worth twice as much as a K18i? Well, honestly, it's gonna depend on who you ask. If you ask me, the answer is no because you can have two K18Is for the same price as one Schmidt Bender. So you could technically upfit two weapons and still not have the entire price of the Schmidt Bender Dual CC. But technically, that is not the question I have asked. I have asked, what is the best LPVO on the market? Not what is the best value LPVO on the market. And performance-wise, absolutely, positively, the Schmidt Bender Dual CC is the best LPVO on the market. Gentlemen, I appreciate you guys for being here throughout this entire series. I've had a ton of fun. We'll see you next time.